Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your love and your kindness. You've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. We ask you now that you open our hearts to be receptive to the word of God. Open our ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say. Open our mind that we might comprehend the word of God. And we appreciate you for this now. And we're grateful. In Jesus' name, let the people of God say, Lift your Bibles high into the ear, please. Everyone standing for the reading of God's word. Let's repeat after, let's repeat together the reading of this recital for our faith. Together. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I am a believer, not a doubter. I walk by faith and not by sight. So today I commit to do all that my Bible says for me to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I have a lengthy reading, it's, uh, 12 verses I want to read today deliberately to capture the essence of this particular text. I'm reading for you today from St. John chapter 9 verses 1 to 12. St. John 9, 1 to 12 in the NIV version. It says, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works, the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no man can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, that he asked? He replied, the man they call Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. I don't know. So far, the scripture. Amen. Please take your seats. Look at someone and tell them these simple two words, go wash. <laughs> Look at somebody and say, go wash. <laughs> Ooh, what's that smell I smell? Go wash. May I suggest to you very quickly that these stories also, they reveal a fundamental belief that there is a di direct correlation between what you do and the outcomes you receive. May I also bring to your attention that Jesus carefully and clearly teaches that the struggles we face in life are not always punishment for a particular sin. Just because we go through or experience something doesn't mean that it's because we always sinned or some sin occurred. Because if that's the case, none of us will be here. Can I just say that again? If that's the case, none of us will be here. Because if the Bible says that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Look at somebody and tell them you sinned too. Come on, look around. Don't be afraid of them. Look at them and tell them you sinned too. I don't care how much you come to church. I don't care how much you have your hands up. I don't care how much you praise God. Everybody sins. And don't come counting no big sin and small sin. I drink, you drink. I don't want to hear all of that. Sin is sin. Look at somebody and tell them sin is sin. And God knows that sin is going to occur. It's the nature of humanity to sin, which is why he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for us. But sometimes there are clear temporal punishments that do occur, that when they do occur, there are certain things that are uh, attached to certain things. Because when you consider it this way, if you commit a crime, you should not be surprised that you're going to jail. 
why, why would you all of a sudden become surprised that the police has come to arrest you when you know that you commit a crime? At the end of the day, we must recognize that things that we do do become a, are becoming a result of the things of the result that we get, we get is as a result of what we have done. But everything is not linked like that. There's no absolute to any of that. And so we look at a text this morning that has something completely separate from a gentleman concerning his life. And we find that the gentleman doesn't even ask for healing. He has a condition in his life, according to the scripture, that it happened somewhere in the birth. And this man is just sitting, minding his own business. So there are three points that would happen. It's not like a Baptist preacher. There are three points that would happen <laughs> within the text that I want to highlight. First, the disciples raise a theological question. Second, Jesus gives them a theological correction. And third, Jesus gives a theological demonstration. When I look at the first portion of this, in, in case you don't notice, I read the first two verses or rather the first five verses deliberately for you to understand. A question comes about as a result of a person's birth condition a man is sitting let me set the tone for you a man is literally sitting minding his own business he is in a condition of which has occurred from birth and this man sits there doing what he's been doing for quite some time begging to survive in other words his hands is out and he's requesting some assistance. But a certain group of religious group, let me be clear on that, a religious group of folks happened to see Jesus in the vicinity and point out the man and ask the question, did the man sin or did his parents sin that this situation has occurred? You know, it's out of some people's foolish thoughts and behavior that people honestly could get victory and deliverance. It is the ignorance of some folks that can open the door for others who just simply believe God. We read a text where they're asking, what did he do wrong? And that is because somewhere in the premise, we have a theological concept in our head. That if something goes wrong, God is upset with me. If something didn't work out the way it, is, it, it should have been according to us, God doesn't love me anymore. That is nothing but a tactic of the devil simply trying to decrease your faith in your God. Because if that's the case, again I repeat, all of us would be in trouble. Because there's always something going on. Scripture teaches us also even in the book of Job that Job in chapter 1 was a perfect and an upright man. He didn't do anything for the stuff that hit him along the journey. He loses his wife, loses his children, loses land, loses cattle all in a day. And what would one say? The first things his friends see him is you and God must really be at odds with each other. For this situation to have occurred. My brothers and sisters, may I repeat myself deliberately. If that's the case, all of us are in trouble. Because none of us have done so bad that God would come against us in that manner. Knowing that humans are just prone to sin. Job loses everything and even his wife talks like a foolish woman. And tells him just curse God and die. And he turns and tells that that's not going to happen. Why? Because God knows that there's certain times in our lives, certain things are just going to happen. And truth of the matter is, none of us can do anything about it. If God is a sovereign God, he knows what is going to happen from moment to moment. It is my responsibility to trust the sovereign God. That whatever does occur, he's got my best interest at hand. 
because he says, I know the plans I have for you. They are good plans. They are not evil plans. I know exactly how I plan to bring you out. I know exactly how I plan to deliver you. I know exactly how to work this on your behalf. Jesus now is dealing with a question from some people about a man who had nothing to do with either of the two of them, was simply sitting and begging. Now, if you, you paint the picture a little bit more, Jesus is standing there talking with some people who were religious about an area concerning another man's life. The other man has nothing to say because he's being talked about right in front of his face. He's not a part of the conversation, people. He is simply sitting there when they're talking about him. He does not know how this thing is going to work. He doesn't even know whether he's going to be a part of a conversation. He has heard some religious folks ask a religious question about the condition that a man sitting by is in. Figure the whole picture out in the story. You're sitting there and they're talking about you. Most folks would have stopped begging and addressed what they were saying more than likely to, the, uh, to those who are accusing him of doing something wrong and that's why he's in the condition he is. You and I both know, don't sit there and act holy. You and I both know when folks start talking about you and you are sitting right there and they talking to you about you right in front of your face, that's fighting words. Am I telling the truth or am I not? Come on, don't, don't, don't get holy. Look at me. Tell the truth. Say, Bishop, tell the truth. Fighting words. Not everybody's going to sit down and be quiet. There are a few that will sit down and be quiet. There are others of us who ain't going to sit there and be so quiet. And go, ask, Lord, you just come and help me along the journey because right now I'm going to put this one into place. That's the nature of what's happening. The man is literally just sitting there and they're talking about the man's condition while the man is there. He doesn't have a say so and he doesn't even know what the outcome is going to be. But may I suggest that when God wants to work a work of miracle and that you are set for a glory, you don't have to open your mouth all the time for God to defend who you are. When God has you on the list for victory, you can just sit there and watch God work things out on your behalf. Because the man sits there as a man with an impaired vision, not simply bothering anybody, only asking for some financial help. Not knowing today is his day. Not knowing that he is simply innocent begging and somebody just made him get noticed he didn't get noticed by himself like blind Bartimaeus who went yelling saying Jesus have mercy upon me this man is just sitting minding his own business and Jesus turns and takes their question the theological question and corrects them about their religiosity because most folks are more religious than they are in relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, it is. It is Sunday morning and they get up and they go to church. It is Sunday morning and if they're not in church on Sunday morning, they feel like the world has caved in on them. And by Monday morning, that same religious person is cussing somebody out at the corner who just cut them off in the wrong way while they're driving and there went one finger up in the air. Where'd all that Jesus go that you just had while you were sitting up in here? Where'd the, where the Jesus go while you're at the supermarket and they cut you off and you were online and somebody got in front of you? Where'd where, where the, where the Jesus go while you were getting on the train and they pushed you and you almost fell and that's a whole other story? See, some of y'all sitting there, Bishop, just kind of move on. Just move on right now. Let's move, move right along. Move right along. Why? Because your Christianity is now being questioned. Because I 
action, the, the reactions that we do tell more about who we really are at the end of the day. Because we have all Christ while you're among Christ in church in Christ. But the minute something pushes you the wrong way, all your Christianity goes out the door. May I suggest that when you really have Christ, it does not go out the door. It stays firm in you. And the Holy Spirit speaks to you and convicts us. Pull it, up, pull it in, Eric. Remember who you are. Because we never know who is watching at any time. I am a perfect witness of when every now and again when the Eric rises up, not the Bishop Gons, when the Eric rises up. And then here comes somebody, hello, Bishop Gons, how are you? Just when I was about to go off, hello, Bishop Gons, how are you? I'm like, I don't feel like being Bishop Gons right now. I need to tell this person. <laughs> Why? Because Christ in us, the hope of glory must be seen at all times. Here's the man sitting by. Here's the man not saying anything. Here's the man a part of a discussion that he did not even ignite. And Jesus goes entirely past the man, never says a word to the man. He says a word to those who ask the question. What is your problem that you keep accusing people for things they never done? Why is it that you all are living your lives blaming people for things they had no part of or had no control over? Why is it that you all, you religious folks, always think that because something has occurred in somebody's life, they are worse than somebody else? Do you realize if that's the case, again I repeat, none of us would be here? Jesus is saying, where did you all pick this garbage up from? Because I don't even have that in my word. There's nowhere in scripture. Which means they interpreted something in the religious orders to mean something that God did not mean. And we hear that every single day of life. If you ask me the question, I know I can get in trouble with the conservatives. But you ask the question, where did suit and tie come from that a man has to wear suit and tie in church? There is nowhere in scripture that tells me I need to put on a tie, I need to put on a three-piece suit in order for me to go to church. Nowhere in scripture. If you find it, let me see it. There's nowhere in that. Nowhere. But we create these things to be religious so we can look more holy. And I know those who wear suit and tie and they are not holy. Because if it's a suit and tie that's going to make my determined salvation, I am in trouble with these material things that dry rot after a while. It is a heart condition. I need to know where your heart is, the Lord says. I need to know is your heart clean and pure toward everybody that I put on the face of the earth. You see, you got to look at this because when you look at the second half of how this is working, Jesus' statement is so profound. It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Whoa! Are you reading the text? That the works of God, in other words, what has happened or is going to happen in any of our lives, never settle and best believe that it's just happened. Look and look for the area. How is God going to get the glory out of this? How is God going to be recognized? How many people are going to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ because of what I am currently going through in my life? How am I going to get closer to the Lord? How is the Lord going to now get closer to me? How is God going to work a miracle out that has not yet been worked, not just in me, but in those who are on looking or looking on how I am functioning in the midst of this? God is sovereign. And his sovereignty means that he has a plan concerning everything. And I've got to do whatever it takes to keep my faith and trust God till God works out the plan. Even in the midst of confusion, even in the midst of incomprehensible thought processing, I've got to know that the Bible tells me in 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon to test you. As though something strange was happening to you. 
But you, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. I get excited when I'm going through some stuff and at a certain point in time I feel depressed while going through some stuff but then I remember the word of God and I get as much God's word in me that I can feed on what I need when I am going through some stuff. I've got to put so much word in me because when I can't hear your advice, when I can't hear your support, when I can't in my natural hear, hear your encouragement, I've got to dig deep into my soul and remember that Romans 8 and 28 says, and we know that all things work together for the good, for those who are the called according to God's purpose. I am willing to go through it so that God can get the glory from it I am willing to deal with it so that God can shine through me and somebody else can see that God can still do a miracle I am willing to worship and praise until God shows up in my life I am willing to stand my ground until God gives me clear direction as to how this thing is going to work I am willing to not lose my faith but to rest upon the Lord God Almighty that when this is all over I will come through as pure gold somebody put your hands together and say I'm willing to go through it I want to make the picture clear here in my timeline that the man had not asked to be healed look at your neighbor and say the man never asked to be healed the only thing the man was doing was begging the only thing he was doing was asking for assistance. But Jesus said, we must work the works of him who sent me. While it is day for night cometh when no man can work. Now let's zoom in for a quick moment here. When this all occurs and the man is sitting there and they are discussing the man and the man has not said one word. Everything has talked about him, but he has not inserted his voice in this. Let's zoom out, zoom out for a moment, for just a quick second, and notice something. You have the blind man minding his own business. There are other examples that are around the man who are listening to the man, listening to them talk about the man, but the man makes no requests. Let's zoom back in and recognize that Jesus is now saying, since you brought him up, since you use him as an example, since you decided to get all up in his business and accuse him for something that he had nothing to do with, I'm going to show you how God works. I'm going to show you how God knows how to come and bless those who you think God has forgotten. I'm going to show you how God knows how to bring miracles upon people who you think God would not bring a miracle upon. I'm going to show you how God can work out people's lives that you have cut off, cast off, and think that because they are begging, God will never look in their direction. Because it is obvious that you wouldn't even look in the man's direction because you have already accused him of sinning. You have already accused his parents of sinning. So you have already put him in a place that you believe that the religious orders would not reflect upon him. But because your orders of religiosity has been a problem from the time that you all have been working it, I've come that they might have life. I've come that the blind might see. I've come that the lame might walk. I've come that the people you have rejected and don't believe they have a right to the kingdom of God are going to get recognized. You might have meant it for evil, for asking me who sinned, him or his parents, but God meant it for good because had you not asked me the question, we would have never looked at this man. Had you not asked me the question, you would have passed him by and did not even recognize his existence. But because he was a conversation in your group, because he was a conversation behind the scenes, when you talk about me behind my back, I promise you, 
God has an ear that hears. And when my heart is in the right place, God will show up and do what he tends to do for his own glory. Somebody put your hands together and give God praise. Look at your neighbor and say, talk about me if you will. That will get God's attention in my life. I don't think you heard what I just said. The more you talk about me, the more God recognizes me. The more you think I'm all that and then some, and you run your mouth about me, the more God says, thank you for letting me know that he's sitting right over there. Because a table I would prepare for him in the presence of his enemies. I will remind him that the Lord is his light and salvation. And whom shall he fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Hallelujah. I remember that he's my keeper, my bulwark. The more you talk, the more he bless. Matter of fact, look at somebody and say, please talk about me, please. Please talk about I Look at somebody and tell them, I need you to talk about me. Oh, I don't know if you hear what I just said. Look at somebody and say, I need you to talk about me. I, I need you, please talk about me. Because the more you talk, the more God recognizes. I've learned to live my life every day better and better by not paying people any mind. Things that used to bother me, don't bother me no more. If you think that, you can keep thinking that. If you think you have all the information, you can get all the information. If my life is so important to you that you got no business that you can handle, that you got to be all up in my business, do whatever you need to survive. but I'm going to live my life happy. And I'm going to be the best me I can be. Because nobody can be the better me than me itself. Look at somebody again and say, please talk about me. Because they talked about the man, the man got recognized. Because they brought his name up in a conversation, the man was noticed by Jesus. May I suggest Jesus might have just kept going. May I suggest Jesus might have passed him by. But because they brought him up for the subject. May I suggest however at that time now Jesus said well since he is the importance of your conversation. Let me might as well do something that you all cannot do. Because what you can do is run your mouth. What you can do is bring up religious orders. What you can do is bring up traditions that are keeping people back from the house of God. What you can do is bring up yoke, put yokes on people that you yourself refuse to carry. What you can do is make people feel bad about where they've been as if they don't have a right to be a better tomorrow. So let me just show you what we're going to do with him. Jesus does what I love so much and best. He begins to work with the dirt. This is not the first time Jesus works with the dirt. There are several texts that he does this with, but I, I'll just go back to say at least one of the cross references. When he creates Adam, he starts with the dirt. And inside the dirt are the particles and the nutrients and all of the things that he used to create the eye socket and all of the vessels and the veins and everything was created from the dirt. So God, through Christ Jesus, goes back to the dirt. And he puts his saliva, which is understood to have nutrients in it. And the nutrients in the saliva, and I know that's very hard for most of y'all to understand this concept. Because you're being scorny. I'm probably right along there with you. But at the end of the day, when there's a condition to be had, you don't think about certain things. The man is in a condition where only Jesus can help. And he works the dirt. And it is in the dirt that God puts his saliva. And the saliva and the dirt are now becoming what we would call a mud pie. Now the mud pie is being prepared to be placed on a body he already created. The body is made of nothing but dirt. I don't care how long you stay in the shower. 
You come out and you start drying off and you still, still see more dirt coming off left and right. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you don't know what I'm talking about, you don't take showers. So everybody sees dirt on a consistent basis. You could be as clean as you think you are. Dirt is still somewhere in the crevice. But at the end of the day, when he puts his hand here, it reminds me of when Jesus sat down on the ground and he played with the dirt at that time. And then he made the words, he that is without sin. You ask me who sinned him or his parents. Who made the problem that he is in? He that is without sin cast the first stone. Can you imagine the thoughts that must be going through the man's mind? They talked about me. They brought me up into a subject. I didn't bother anybody. I just wanted some money to help me get some food or how to survive. And now here I am sat in the midst. This man hasn't even asked me if I want sight. He is actually working a dirt. And the man is sitting there not knowing he's about to get a blessing. Thing. Can you imagine the man might have said, is he going to ask me a question? Is he going to talk to me? Is he going to see if I have anything to say about the two discussions the two of them just had concerning my life? But the beggar still it hasn't, the beggar still hasn't said a word. A word. But Jesus has, says to him, doesn't even say to him, Jesus just puts the whole spittle of the mud pie on him. In other words, I'm not asking you if you want to be healed. I'm going to heal you because I know how and what has to happen in your life in order for God to get glory. If your faith is not in place, God still can work some miracles in your life. If you don't believe the way you should believe, God can still do some stuff that will get you to believe. If you don't trust the way you should trust, God will do it not because you trust, but because he knows he has plans for your life and these plans must bring forth the glory of God for you and everyone else that is watching the Bible says he put the mud pie on the man's eyes and may I suggest to you that while dirt could be considered a harmful product because whenever dirt gets in your eye you're playing it all and you're doing all kinds of stuff till it gets red but this time it was used for medicinal purposes. I don't have time to break it all down, but the Lord can heal a person any way he chooses. Now, I'm not spitting in my hand and put on nobody's face today. We're not doing that. My other colleague did that already. God bless him. <laughs> We're not doing that. But what we are going to understand, what we are going to understand is that God can heal any way he wants what we are going to understand is that part of the healing comes with obedience because this man never asked to be healed but he became a part of a product a part of a situation and when he is told go wash there is no question about why I should wash there is no question about where I should wash there is no question about how long I should wash. We, most of the times, we have a question about everything. I've told you in my life growing up, I was always in trouble because I never took what my mother said. I had to have a question behind her, behind her command. Go to the store. Why? Be back, be home by 3 o'clock. Why? Why can't I go, be home by 11 o'clock at night? Why? It was all those stuff that got me in trouble. Don't say they act like I'm the only one. Some of y'all had the same stuff. I just said, well, I just said so, pow! I don't know how my face has not been disfigured at this point. Still trying to figure that out. These backhanded movements that happen just come out of nowhere too. Pow! <laughs> yeah, anybody, you know what I'm talking about? These backhands. The man never questioned why the pool of Silo. He was told, go wash! Go wash. Look at somebody and say, go wash. When there's dirt in your life, you need wash. When there's some situations in your life that you don't know how to handle, go wash. And I'm not, tell, I'm not sending you down to the mother so-and-so and Rupert does so-and-so and, and get a wash. That's not what I'm doing. 
Let me clear that up. Something just came right up in my spirit. Somebody go in ahead and get a bath. I'm not sending you to go get a bath. Don't do that. Look at somebody say, I'm not sending you for that. Your best bath is the shower. Get your dial and your soap. Clean your skin and keep it going. And keep your money in your pocket and pay your rent. Up there giving them money for a bath and, you can't, and then you can't afford your mortgage. The devil is a liar. He was simply saying, get rid of the dirt that is in the, light, in the way that I put on you. In other words, you can't keep the mud pie on your face for the rest of your life. The mud pie is only working a miracle in your life. The mud pie is only working out what God is going to get the glory from. What you are going through is only going to be temporary. It looks permanent. The enemy wants us to believe it's permanent. But I hear the Holy Ghost saying clearly, there's a mud pie on your life. And I'm going to use the ingredients of the mud pie to show you the glory of God. It is your problem that got you noticed. Ooh, if you don't have a problem, nobody is noticing you. But when you have a problem in your life, it will get you noticed. Whether they have the answer for you or they don't have the answer for you. But who has the answer is my God. And because of your mouth, I got my healing. Ooh, I don't know if you heard what I just said. Because of your mouth on my life. He recognized me, and I got the healing. In other words, you talked about the man, and you think I'm going to leave the man in the condition of which you talked about him? You blamed him for stuff he had nothing to do with? You cast him out as, he was, as if he is the least of the least and the bottom of the crop? You make people feel like they're nothing when they come into church because you have been in church for the last 10 years every Sunday and you're just as wicked as if you had never been here. And you want to make me feel bad? No, God is saying clearly, this is who I came for. I came that they might have life and that they might have life more abundantly. I close they didn't try to help the man they talked about the man I need to say that again they didn't try to help the man they talked about the man and they called themselves religious I don't want religion and I don't want to be religious I want Jesus Christ son of the living God I want the Holy Spirit to guide me and grant me wisdom to walk through the streets, see evil from a distance and go the opposite way. If you're going to talk about me, then offer me help. But because you have no power and you're powerless, you're only good for your mouth, but you've got no Holy Ghost. And the church has failed in that area. We failed at how we win souls. The scripture never sees Jesus condemning anybody. He says, I never came to condemn. I came to fulfill. But the church finds ways to keep people out. I try to figure, how do we pack the church when we preach a message that keeps people away from the church? And if not the message, our actions keep people from the church more than the message. Which is why I often say, if somebody is nasty to you in this church, they are not a reflection of me. I'm done. I need to say, stand on your feet. I'm done. If somebody is nasty, look at your neighbor and say, if you are ever nasty to me, Look at somebody and tell them, if you are ever nasty to me, you are not a reflection of the bishop. You are a reflection of yourself. And you are a reflection of the enemy. But you are not a reflection of me. 
I'm not saying I don't, I, I have no error. I have errors and wrongs and just like anybody else. Ask Lady Garns, we live together. She got errors too. Get on my nerves sometimes. Hallelujah. But one thing of many that I practice to the best of my ability to be nice to people. I know some people just, they're just nasty. They're just, just, just nasty. And nasty for no reason, elderly. Just nasty. Find reasons to argue and yell and try to cover it up with all excuses as to why I'm going through, I'm feeling a hard day. Now, you're just nasty. You need a transformation in your life. That's miserable. And since I'm Panamanian, I got to say it a certain way. They're miserable. Because, you know, you can't say that in regular English way. You got to say it with a little twang with it. You're miserable. How many of you know some people like that? Don't look around because some of them are sitting right here in the church. They're sitting right up in here. You know I'm telling the truth, Minister Olivia. They sit right here. Just miserable. And I just don't understand it, daughter. I don't. I like living my life, life and laughing and joy. And let's go to the beach and play parks and go to the pool and ride your bike. You can't even pass them in it. Why, 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 why you look at me like that? Come on. You need to get washed. With that kind of attitude, you need to be washed. And not by rose water and not by the, by, by the suit sayer. You need to get washed in the blood of Jesus. It's free. You have to pay for that one. It's free. It's just free. What can wash away all of my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Come on and give God a hand clap of praise. Come on, praise him. Praise him. 